We recently asked a couple hundred of you emerging biotech leaders about your go-to sources of information when you face tough professional challenges. Your top response wasn't webinars, it wasn't scientific journals, it wasn't trade shows, it wasn't even consultants. Far and away, you said you most often turn to your peers for trusted insight. Enabling a community of peers is what the Business of Biotech podcast is all about. It's also what our new Business of Biotech newsletter is all about. Peer-driven content, no strings attached, delivered to your inbox once a month. Go to bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B to subscribe. The Business of Biotech is produced by Bioprocess Online, part of the Life Science Connect community with support from Cytiva. Cytiva also demonstrates its commitment to the leaders of new and emerging biopharma at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. Check that out. In February, Clinical Stage Moon Lake Therapeutics announced that it had completed patient enrollment and randomization ahead of schedule in its phase two trial of the nanobody sonolocumab in moderate to severe hydrodentitis superativa, a painful and chronic skin condition that causes abscesses and scarring. That candidate comes on the heels of a phase three ready trial of the molecule in psoriasis and ahead of a phase one trial in psoriatic arthritis. The molecule itself has a very unique origin story and Moonlight's aspirations for it are lofty. Inflammation is a competitive space with some big name approvals serving it. But Moonlight founder and CEO, Dr. George Santos da Silva, says the current standards of care fall well short of the patient need. For his part, Dr. Santos da Silva brings some equally unique experience to the helm at Moonlake, his first foray into startup biotech. I'm Matt Piller. This is the business of biotech. And Dr. Santos da Silva is with me today to share some stories. George, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. How'd I do on pronunciations of the molecule and uh, and, and your and your lead indication? We'll we'll improve as the call goes through. <laughs> I, pre- I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, George gave me permission to re- reference the molecule as SLK and HS throughout the conversation. So if I do that, just know know that's what I'm referencing. Um, and George, I want to start with you. Uh, I, I want to start with you and get get to know you a little bit. I'm going to nutshell this a little bit and then ask you to un- unpack it. So. Um, as I mentioned, you have a unique, unique upbringing uh, in, in the in the formative years, right? In, in advance of your founding of Moonlake, you earned your PhD in neurobiology. Okay, yeah, that might contribute, you know, uh, on paper, kind of contribute to to the direction you took. Uh, you worked as a scientist at Cold Spring Laboratory for a couple of years, uh, a couple of few years. Okay, you know, we're on track so far. Then you made uh, what looks like a pretty stark change when you switched to McKinsey. And, and, and the switch to McKinsey in and of itself, not un, not, not uncommon. I've seen that before. Uh, it's it's not an uncommon stop for, for guys like you, but it's usually a pretty brief stop. You stay there for 14 years, stayed at McKinsey for 14 years in a consulting realm. Uh, and then uh, after, after more than 14 years at McKinsey, uh, just in 2021, so like just yesterday, practically, you you left McKinsey to found Moon Lake. So that, that's where things get a little bit interesting for me. So I, I want to unpack that, like start where you want to on that continuum, like, you know, back uh, may, maybe coming out of your PhD. But tell us how that kind of unfolded uh, and, and ultimately led to the founding of Moon Lake. Sure, Matt. Now, pleasure, pleasure to uh, to talk to talk about that progression. Um, I, I would argue that there is actually a common thread. Um, it's it's really about science, but also how science can create impact, impact for for patients or impact for investors, where where you really turn all the things you do in a lab in, into something that 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 has an impact in in the real world, if you will. So, I had a as you said, at about. 10, 12 years in academia overall, all the degrees that you're used to, to seeing, um, you know, they were very formative years because, of course, as a scientist, you learn to unpack problems, think about problems, problem solve, uh, oftentimes at the edge and the limits of, of, of what is known. Uh, and I had the, the, I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to work with, with groups and people that do, did absolutely stellar science. So, Taught me about science. You talked about taught me about science of quality and, and quality in science. Let, let me put it like that. Um, at, at a certain point, in like in everybody's career in science, you you take stock. To me, science became you know the more senior you are, it's just too too much administration and too little science. 
Mm. Um, and, and so I thought, you know, is there a way for me to learn new things and to accelerate how science gets somewhere? Um, and, and that was the attraction at, at McKinsey. Another another very fortunate step for me, not only working with with very smart people that everybody knows, but <clears throat> working in very diverse places in the world, in very diverse places in the industry, both on the farm and the biotech side, and with very diverse people. Yeah. Um, so that really gave me a very broad look of how you take science into real products, into real companies, into real patients. Um, and, and, you know, learning through through that and being exposed, for example, to the immunology markets very closely, being exposed to how companies get formed and financed really accelerated the expression of my entrepreneur's uh, gene. Um, and so when the opportunity came to start Moon Lake, um, you know, I grabbed it, I grabbed it with both hands and I thought, what a great opportunity to put my science background and my business background together yeah. to, to, to really translate something, uh, something into, into, the, into the real world. There are many assets out there. Uh, there are many things that need to be put into companies and brought, brought to market into patients. And uh, Sony Lokimab or SLK um, felt exactly like the right molecule. We had the right team. It was the right time, the right investors. McKinsey was a, was a great place. I had a very comfortable life, but I exchanged that for the slightly more uncomfortable uh, biotech life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So, so you're at McKinsey, like I said, you're, you're there for quite a while. Um, and when this opportunity, like how did the opportunity present itself to, to you while you're at McKinsey? Like how, how did it kind of come to fruition? Yeah. Now, as I was saying before, Matt, I think if you, if you work in a company like, like McKinsey and you're exposed to so many different pharma companies, so many different regulatory agencies, countries, markets, et cetera, you, you really realize that to the market, you only see arriving the the, the, the sort of a, a very small percentage of everything that is that is developed. So I, I really real, realized over the years that there were many many assets out there that were oftentimes being deprioritized, right? Because mm. something else was more important at that given point in time for that given company. Yeah. Um, and and one of the and obviously had a, a particular inclination to assets in immunology, which is an area area I know well inflammation, uh, you know, a, a group uh, or an area of disease that, that is really underserved and has a lot of, a lot of needs. Um, and, and so when, it, when we saw the opportunity to license uh, Sonalokimab or SLK out of Merck, um, where, where the product was deprioritized, we thought, hey, this is, this is an, this is an ex exciting opportunity. What was interesting about SLK is that it, it, it was also a very unique an innovative asset. So here we are. This is a nanobody. We'll, we'll probably talk more a bit about it, but it's kind of the next technology after the all impacting uh, uh, antibodies. Yeah. Um, it was. Uh, it, it's a nanobody that that focuses on an M, on a mechanism of action inhibition of L seventeen A and F that is very new um, and and that is showing a lot of potential. So it's thought, hey, we really have a winning a winning MOA here. But at the same time, as I said, it was a, a very de-risk profile. There was already a lot known about the asset. Um, and it was uh, a very undervalued asset. It was not being developed forward. Yeah. Uh, I, I should also mention, Matt, that, of course, I founded the company together with Professor Christian Reich. He's my good friend and co-founder. He was actually on the clinical side doing research and, and conducting a phase two with this asset. Yeah. So there we are, two, two good friends, two two. Uh, Equally minded people looking at an asset that has a lot of potential. Hey, this is the this is the time to 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 get going. And as I said, inflammation is just an area with enormous unmet need, and and uh, we felt they, this is this is something that can really impact. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Like, what, what, why, uh, why at the founding the focus around psoriasis and psori psoriatic arthritis and and uh, other inflammatory diseases was that um, sort of the 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 was that tra trajectory kind of predisposed by by the molecule itself? Yeah, I, I would say so, Matt. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, we obviously, I knew a lot about the immunology space from a, from a development and a market perspective. Uh, my co-founder, Christian, knew, knew it well from a, from a, from a clinical perspective. He's a, a very well-known um, dermatologist uh, or a, immunodermatologist. So, of course, we had, a, we had a particular emphasis in that area. But I think our... Our passion for that area also comes from the fact that 
while several of these immune diseases, especially where you have chronic inflammation, um, are, are already treated today. You know, let's use the case of, of psoriasis. Uh, a lot of these chronic inflammations occur in many different tissues, in many different organs, oftentimes with very complex patterns, oftentimes very deep in the tissue. Um, and, and so a lot of them remain unresolved, uh, either the need to supportive or HS, sorry, Arctic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, you name it, cholangitis, there's many of them. Yeah. Um, and we thought it, that, uh, you know, here's an, an area that we know quite a bit about where the unmet needs are very high because, of, again, you don't have therapeutical solutions to solve this problem. And where many of these diseases, once the inflammation uh, settles in, uh, you actually accumulate irreversible damage through your lesions. So things that are not only chronic diseases, but actually will diminish the quality of life of patients as they go on. Yeah. And as I said, many of these have, have really almost no therapeutic solution. I mean, HS has one drug approved uh, in the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, joining a passion with an understanding with, with, a, with a real perception that, uh, that we need to do something here uh, and that there's a lot of, obviously a lot of space to unlock value. Yeah. Just a, just a curious aside question about uh, your time at McKinsey and the transition into uh, foundership of a, of a biotech. I mean, over 14 years at McKinsey, you, you, you see a lot of, uh, we'll call them youngsters come and go, right? Like young, young hotshots, they come and go, right? A lot of those young hotshots I've interviewed. I mean, you know, it's uh, like the, the McKinsey alum are, are, are pretty, pretty frequent guests on the business of biotech. Um, but typically when they leave McKinsey, they probably go into big pharma for a while, you know, uh, kind of, sharp hone their skills right sharpen up uh, in some big pharma maybe move into emerging biotech in some capacity maybe in the c suite director level uh, before eventually maybe founding their own company i mean is it atypical to uh to, to come right out of the consultancy and and just like found a a, a biopharma and and one that we'll get into this but but one that in very short order has established it's established itself you know, in a solid way on the clinical, clinical, clinical journey. So I'm just curious, is, is that as uncommon as I may perceive it to be? I, I don't think it's, it's very common, Matt. Um, I, I don't want to sound uh, uh, not humble, but it, yeah. it actually doesn't happen very often. Yeah. I think it's just maturing and learning in two different ways, right? You spend two or three years in a, in a phenomenal company like, like, like McKinsey, and then you move on to the industry and you learn other things or, like me, you spent 14 years around and actually learning about different places of the industry, different countries, different situations uh, without being within a certain corporate environment. So maybe learning about less about certain things, but more, more, more about others. I think ultimately, you know, starting a company and getting the right investment also has to do with 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 the value of the idea that you're bringing. Yeah. Um, and, and with the with the team that you that you put together and obviously somehow the team and and the investors and, and the company that we licensed the asset from thought that I could could do a good job. And uh, here, here we are, you know, we'll 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 see how it happens. Yeah. Well, it's happening pretty, pretty well so far. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned the molecule itself, uh, and, and I want to spend some time there because it's super interesting to me. Uh, Moonlight therapies, they're derived from nanobodies, as you said, you know, we're differentiating nanobodies from, uh, from antibodies, um, nanobodies for our audience benefit, th those who, who may not be in the know, nanobodies are derived from llamas and other camelids, which are, uh, you know, <laughs> llamas. I, when I think llamas, I think, you know, farm animals, pack animals, you know, we harvest some wool, you go to the petting zoo, they're spitting in kids' faces, <laughs> Um, that, that's the llama, like that's my knowledge of the, of, of the llama. So I, I, I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to move from my simplistic take on the llama to the highlights on the discovery of this, uh, discovery and, and the processes, uh, that, that elevated what I'm, you know, describing as this lowly llama, uh, <laughs> from, from, from the farm to a budding biotech superstar. Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, that's a really good, uh, pretty good setup. Really pretty good setup there. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it's as good uh, a while back. I don't know how many episodes ago it was. I had Rochelle Jacques from Akari uh, Therapeutics on the show and, and their, their molecules derived from uh, tick, tick saliva, you know, so I, I, ha I had some pretty colorful uh, wor words for that setup as well, but, but this is super intriguing to me. You know, we, we talked a little bit on that episode and, and uh, about how it's sort of every, you know, young, you know, even at a young age, a, a kid, 
a kid scientist, right? Like a backyard scientist, like wants to explore the possibilities around, you know, therapeutic potential from whatever they find, <laughs> from whatever they find. Right. And in this case, we're talking about llamas. Exactly. Um, so, 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 you know, may, maybe the setup is, uh, is, is, is grandiose, but, but I'm just curious, like, can you tell us the or, origin story about how we, how we went from like I, discovering I, this? I, no, absolutely. I, I think it's, it's quite interesting. And maybe let's just split this in, in, in a couple of points. Let's, let's talk about these animals and why these animals, and then let's talk a little bit what, how, how it came about that, that all this technology was found. Right. So, yeah. Let, let, let's start in the animals. So uh, llamas, alpacas, but also animals like sharks. Um, they have <clears throat> a lot of similarities in their immune system to ours, but they have quite some important differences. And one of those important differences is uh, nature equipped them with antibodies that are different from ours. So whereas our antibodies have... Uh, a heavy chain and a light chain um, in each of the size of the antibody and therefore have a size of, Matt, let's say about 150 kilodalton to use a, a measure of molecular size. Uh, and they do the fantastic job. We all know they do. Um, <clears throat> these animals evolved to have a slightly different version of antibodies where there's only a heavy chain. Mm. So this makes these antibodies much smaller but it also means because you don't have the variable um, uh, segment of a heavy chain and a light chain, uh, which in our case, in our antibodies, is what forms the binding domain to a certain target. The fact that they only have a heavy chain means that this domain is also monomeric. It's also just one sequence and not two. Mm. And this little sequence, which is called a VHH or a nanobody, um, is actually something that you can purify and is about 10 times smaller than an antibody, okay? Um, the interesting thing is that this is probably the smallest biological unit known to retain all the great characteristics of an antibody, which is, you know, very high affinity, very high, very high specificity, et cetera, um, but in packing it in a much, much smaller uh, molecule. So as I said, about 10 times smaller than, uh, than, than, uh, than, than an antibody. So th these are the, 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 these are the nanobodies. The nanobodies are, are, are quite interesting because um, <clears throat> they are, they are relatively easy to produce and I'll come to that. But you can also take these, these, these domains, these VHHs, these nanobodies and link them together um, <clears throat> to create multimeric molecules. So this is really exciting because if you have an antibody, you have this massive molecule, which is fantastic, but only binds one target. Mm -hmm. It can only bind one epitope. Now I can make smaller molecules, putting these little pieces together where I can bind completely different epitopes. Okay. And in the case of sonilokimab, this is particularly interesting. Whereas you have antibodies out there, monoclonal antibodies that bind to L17A, like Cosentix from Novartis, or like us, can modulate IL-17A and F. There's only one molecule, one monoclonal that does this called Bimekizuma from UCB. It does so by recognizing an epitope that is common between the two. We have multiple domains. So we have one that binds to F, another one that can bind a sequence that is present in A and F, and we even have a third domain in there. So the, they're so small that you can put them together form these multimeric molecules with very high affinity and specificity. And even when you put, put them all together, like in our case, we have three of these put together, we are still one third the size, the size of, of an antibody, right? Mm, yeah. So we leverage something that nature created in some animals that we would argue are quite, are quite successful. Again, not only camelids, but also sharks, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and we take that, that, that technology that, uh, that uh, nature created to create these multimeric molecules that are super high affinity, are quite safe, and as I said, are are relatively relatively easy to, or compared to monoclons, re relatively easy to to produce. How how they were discovered, you know, there's there's always many stories. Um, I, I think one that is quite consistent, Matt, is these these the, these heavy chain only antibodies were were discovered about thirty to forty years ago. 
uh, one of the one of the main or some of the main labs that were discovering these were were based in Europe and Belgium. Groups like the group of uh, Serge Mulderman, and it, it, it was found by chance. Uh, at the time, students, researchers had a really hard time working with human blood. We were in the middle of the AIDS um, the AIDS epidemic, so mm -hmm. people didn't really want to work too much with uh, with human blood in terms of you know doing basic research in the lab, etc. They had blood from several animals. They picked the llama, um, and all of a sudden, when they ran gels, they were finding a band that they couldn't explain what what is in this blood, right? And yeah. that's how these heavy chain only uh, antibodies were found. And then from there, you know, companies like Ablinks, et cetera, really figured out how to purify this, uh, these segments, clone them into, into, into production cells. And these days, these things are manufactured with 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 cell lines that that are very well known to the industry to produce uh, to produce biologics. W one thing, Matt, that I absolutely must talk about, uh, just depending on who's listening to this, I just want to be completely clear that we don't have llamas in our factories <laughs> producing, <laughs> yeah. producing this molecule. Uh, it's it's all done in normal fermentation. In this case, with a fungal cell line, uh, very yeah. similar to what you do with CHOs or E. coli. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a important clarification. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> if, if there's any GMP activity going on there, um, it's, it's not, uh, in the same facility where the <laughs> are, are being raised. Not at all. Not at all. So tell me about the differences though. You know, you, 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 you referenced the similarities and parallels to, you know, tr traditional, uh, purification and production manufacturing processes. Um, where 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 does it differ? What what challenges or, or or I guess differences does a company like Moonlight face in uh you know in 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 purification and and production uh compared to perhaps a traditional antibody? Yeah, I think the the the, the simplest way to put it, Matt, it's like the process is a, is a drug substance drug pro process very similar to what you do with uh, with monoclonal antibodies. Um, mm -hmm. One difference is that you don't use CHO cells or E. coli to produce them. Yeah. Uh, you produce them in, uh, in in fungal cell lines, namely in a, a line called Pitya pastoris. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, while you don't have a lot of uh, uh, CMOs manufacturing within within the cell line, which is also kind of interesting because it protects us in in, in many ways. The cell line is quite sturdy. Um, uh, it, the process is extremely stable. Uh, our process, uh, because it has it has had several owners, has been has been transferred several several times. It's extremely stable. Uh, it's a little bit less costly, um, and the purification is methanol based, etc. But a lot of people have have experience with this step. Um, so, and of course, you can you you can produce this with high titer. Um, it's the, the products are a little bit more thermostable than, uh, than monoclonals are. Yeah. Uh, and so if you sum it all together, once you're operating in anything like we are already at anything close to a commercial level, um, you have a, you have a COGS that is, that is extremely, extremely attractive uh, in a process that is extremely attractive. Yeah. Um, so, so I would argue that, uh, nanobodies can be produced more cheaply. Um, in a more stable fashion. And because the molecule is so small, you can pack quite a lot of molecule in very small volumes. Yep. And this ultimately is the most important part because when a patient injects this subcutaneously, that matters, that you can deliver the right dose without unnecessary volume or so that you don't have to inject yourself all month long. Uh, sure. we, we feel that those, those things are important. Yeah, very good. Um, I want to get back to the, the indication a little bit. The first time you and I talk, George, you, you, there was a, there was a pal palpable sense of dissatisfaction uh, with, uh, with, with the treatment paradigm in dermatology and, and rheumatology indications. Uh, so I want to, I want to get into that a little bit. Why, for, first of all, why, like, wh why have we seen little to no improvement in, in decades in, in this space? What's holding it up? I, I think my, more than anything, I think what you, what you felt was my frustration, right? Mm -hmm. Which I, at the same time is the, is, is the thing that drives you to, to keep, to keep pushing in the directions we're pushing. So there are diseases like psoriasis that are very well understood or, or much better understood than others that have been studied for many years. As I said, you, you then have diseases like HS or PSA where the inflammation is a lot more complex where you don't have reversible damage, but irreversible damage. 
um, and where um, the, the the research uh, and understanding that disease is is far more complicated. Uh, and I think what we've seen in the last years is 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 clearly a better understanding of how these diseases work. Um, of course, a lot of attempts of uh, of um, of trying to address the disease and a lot of failures. HS is a disease that is well known for its failures. Um, but on the hand, on the other hand, you learn from these failures because you know, okay, these pathways don't work. We have to try something else. What we believe before doesn't doesn't work. We have to move on. And I think we've seen all all that, and now we know um, that uh, a pathway like the inhibition of IL seventeen A and F, the two cytokines at the same time really can make a difference in, in, in these indications. The frustration comes from the fact that because you don't have uh, therapeutical solutions, these diseases take forever to be diagnosed, right? So they're underdiagnosed. I just give you a, a, a number that haunts me every day, which is in, in your country, in the US or here in Europe, uh, it takes seven or eight years for a patient to be diagnosed with HS, right? right. So. You don't have therapeutic solutions, therefore the disease is not talked about too much, therefore there's not a big understanding about it, therefore it doesn't get diagnosed properly, and it's the patients that pay, right? Yeah. Because the, the, the damage is, is irreversible and the disease is horrible. Yeah. Um, so what that results in is that for 20 years, we've been trying to get a 50% improvement of the disease, right? Uh, that has been the target, and there's only one product, there's only Humira, and it sort of wears off after a year. Mm -hmm. uh, in zoriatic arthritis, you're targeting a 20% improvement on the disease. But if, if patients have multiple lesions, they're in pain, they cannot work, they cannot have a social interaction, I guess, Matt, we could agree that a 20% improvement or 50% improvement is not going to change your life. Contrarily to that, just, just as, a, as a term of comparison, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we were we were treating psoriasis patients with with tar and phototherapy and left them for for two weeks in the hospital, and then all of a sudden we started getting fifty percent improvements with with the first biologics PASI fifty, mm -hmm. and today even our product has already shown this we can reach PASI one hundred right we can completely clear this disease yeah. right whereas in these other indications here we are twenty percent improvements fifty percent improvements that are not durable right. So, so the, the frustration comes from this lack of understanding, which we now get into, um, lack of diagnosis, uh, and, 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 and lack of success in development. Um, but now, as I say, with the IL-17 pathway, and especially with ANF inhibition, there's real, real hope. And I, I, I could tell you, Matt, that we, we are so strongly uh, convinced about, the, about our asset that we, we have used in our, in our clinical trial, in our global phase two for HS, a 75% improvement as our primary endpoint, yeah. right? Um, so that's the type of ambition that we, and I believe others beyond Moonlake are, are trying to achieve to reduce this level of frustration. When you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biopharmas turn their innovations, like mRNA and cell and gene therapies, into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need-to-know topics for biopharma leaders. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash Emerging Biotech. Yeah, I want to, so I, I want to kind of get your sense as to how, I'll, I'll pack a couple questions into one here. You know, I mean, you, you've done a good job explaining, uh, obviously, the, the, the science and and the the reason for optimism there, right? To, the, the, to uh, I guess, um, improve, improve your frustration level. Um <laughs> But at the same time, you know, as we've ascertained, you're 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 moving into a space that uh, is is dominated or run right now by by big pharma, UCB, Novartis. Um, so so I'm curious about you know e even even science aside, like Little Moonlight that's been around for two years. Uh, what makes you think you can muscle your way in uh, into that market and compete with or or even outperform perhaps? 
some of these standards, like beyond just, you know, you, you can, obviously you've got a leg to stand on with, with the science. It sounds like uh, the, the data is is there and, and coming. There's more of it coming. Um, but you still got to have some muscle, right? To get in on that game. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good, good question, Matt. I let, let me break it into two parts, which is you have to have a winning proposition. Um, and then as you say, you have to, to develop the muscle. Right. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that we ran a global phase two with over 300 patients, uh, which is very large by any standard of phase two, where we also had the courage. Let, let me put it like that, if you allow me, Matt, to have Cosentix, which is the, the, the Novartis reference in, uh, in one of the market references in, in, in psoriasis. And the truth of the matter is that when you take full skin clearance in, in psoriasis, PASI 100% improvement, uh, at, at, at peak 16, we, we take 40% more patients to that level. Mm. So all of a sudden in our trial, more than half of the patients, after four months, the chronic disease for life, after four months, they are fully skin clear, right? And that's 40% more patients than, than what you see with the exactly. So. There is this scientific part, right? Uh, and, and we know from all the binding evidence that we have that we are an extremely strong binder to both the cytokines, not just A, which is what Cosentix targets, but A and F, which is this other very important cytokine, even far more abundant than, than IL-17A in all the indications that we're talking about. Um, we have all these, these disease models uh, that, that show that, we, that our small little nanobody really goes deep into the tissue, really binds to the targets deep in that tissue, and that results in a better outcome than using uh, antibodies, even antibodies that are targeted for A and for F. Uh, one, one of those examples is, 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 is bimikizumab. So that, that we, we need to have an asset that really, really makes a difference, right? Um, and I believe that is happening. We will now see more data from bimikizumab in, in March, the UCB product, the only other product that inhibits ANF um, in HS. And then in June, we will we will come out, Matt, and we will turn the card. And we will say, you know, these guys went for 75% improvement. Did they meet the primary endpoint or not? By the way, in our trials, we have Humira also as a comparator arm. So we're not just comparing ourselves to placebo. We're comparing ourselves also to, or at least trying to draw comparisons between ourselves and the standards of care. Yeah. So if that's true, and if we really have that asset, then I think we will be in a in, in a very good position not only to move to phase three, but to start building that 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 muscle to go to market. Yeah. Now on the question of the muscle, um, <clears throat> we obviously phase three will take another another three years or so um, with all the safety periods, etc. So of course that gives us an opportunity to build the organization. We took a, a, a clear decision. Uh, early on that although we have phenomenal data in psoriasis, we're not going to pursue psoriasis because it's very competitive, because there's already quite a lot of alternatives out there. And therefore, maybe the delta in terms of unmet needs is not something that a small company like us can really contribute to. It probably mm -hmm. belongs to somebody else. Um, and, and we wanted to go to areas that have a lot more growth opportunities. So we believe that as we as we have time to build that that commercial that commercial muscle, which of course will come from experienced people in the in the in the in the industry out there, we will have time to prepare to for specific diseases like like HS, like PSA. Now, if you ask me, Matt, will that be absolutely the the ultimate path? You and I know that biotech does not work like that. Uh, if we have a fantastic asset and if a company with a lot more presence. Um, can take it and impact a lot more patients that that actually might be also an option for us in terms of unlocking value to our investors, but also all, also to the patients. So our path is to get there. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we will entertain other discussions as, as you always do in M&A, but we believe that we have time and we're focused in areas that, that really have uh, space to play. Yeah, yeah. And, and as I said early on, you've made... Uh, considerable progress in a short amount of time on, on that journey. Uh, you know, you've got SK phase three ready for psoriasis. You got two more programs in phase two for HS and psoriatic arthritis. Um, it, 
it's it's uh I would say uncommon uh speed of progress for a, a two-ish year old year old company. Give us some insight into how you've been able to move so quickly. Um I mean, did you did you start with you know did you start with a leg up? Did you you know have things just been going in incredibly smoothly? Oh, no, you <laughs> well, I, I think I think you said it right. We were founded in twenty twenty one. We went public in April twenty two, which I think was the eye of the storm. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I'm not sure we we, we timed it well. Mm, um, yeah. But uh, I, I think there's there, there's a couple of things there. One is I think the plan that we designed and the trials that we designed, and I think you. You felt it from what I was saying before. We really put a lot of emphasis in designing trials that really change the game. Uh, our trials are quite large, especially for a company of our size. We always have multiple dose simplicity. We always have a comparator arm with the gold standard for that indication. Let's not underplay that element because you might say, oh, well, but it's big and it's going to take time and cost money. Yes, but it also is going to engage the community. Um, the, the, the people that are in the clinical sites in the hospital treating patients, they see this is a real study, right? Yeah. We're going to learn important things from here. The patients are going to get great care, right? The protocols are interesting, right? So a lot of the progress, we have to be very clear about that, is only possible um, because the, the, the key opinion leaders, the clinical sites, the, the regulators, everybody looks at it and sees the quality of what is being done and the impact it can have. Without that, if I'm going to do little trials with five sites, open label, no placebo, you know, God knows what, just to generate a little bit of data to kind of keep going, very complex stuff that nobody knows if we're going to get to the right dose, if it's going to be approvable, is does it have any pivotal potential? I, I think we cannot forget that. That, I think, is a huge driver of our momentum. The other one, that, let me call that external. The other one is internal. Um, I think we were we were able to put a very, very talented team together, perhaps differently from other companies, Matt. So we focus on a very lean team. We're very few people, uh, very, very experienced. And people that are uh, experienced not only in, 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 their, in, their, in their technical field, but also in working with others in the technical field. Well, what does that mean? It means that we hire people that are experienced, but are also great project managers. Um, so that they can take all the great experience that is out there externally and harness it um, for, for, for Moonlake. And of course, it's easy to hire a consulting service of this and that, but to run it properly and, and having done it before, to really bring it to bear to the company and only what is needed, I think that's a, that's a skill in itself. And that's the kind of people that we hire. So I think we put this, this team together. It's also a team that of people that... Uh, you know, let, let, let me use the word courageous again, are courageous to say, well, if this was done like this before, if, if it takes two years to run a trial like this, we ask why? Uh, maybe we can run it in nine months. Why? How could we run it in nine months? And then that's that's what serves us and guides us. And maybe it's not nine months, maybe it's 10, yeah. but but it's far better than two years, right? So I think the team is all is all is all selected, all selected like that. Um I, I would be remiss not to mention the experience that sits in our board and with our early investors. We are super well aligned. We are all ultra focused. We only have one asset. We focus on indications. We don't distract ourselves with multiple molecules and everybody is in this boat, right? And that facilitates a lot of work also for us as, as a management team and myself as a CEO, if everybody is rowing in the same direction. Maybe yeah. one last, last thing I would say, we are, uh, let, let me call, we are a, a child of the COVID times. Mm -hmm. So when we were born as a company and when we financed ourselves, the exuberance period was gone, right? So we're also very conscious about being focused in taking the, the decisions that get, the, get, the, get us there faster with all the regulation and all the quality. I, I think that's, that's always there because our industry is naturally controlled, if you will. Um, I, I think that 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 allows us to have a very a very lean and focused team um, with a very different burn rate, et cetera, from other companies. So we can really use these resources to 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 move faster. As you said, we've already randomized the the target patients for for our chest trial. That that's uh, over two hundred patients, over sixty sites, U.S. and Europe, 
Um, and we started in May and finished in January, right? So that tells you that somehow this internal and external uh, focus is 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 really coming coming to play. Yeah, yeah. I, I was sitting here as you're talking about these different different facets uh, that have contributed to the the speed of progress. There, I'm I'm sitting here thinking about your your background again. I'm thinking about the you know the the, the time that you spent at McKinsey, being exposed to you know dozens, if not hundreds, I'm sure of, of biotechs. Um, how, how often, I'm sure a lot of this is subconscious. Uh, I'm, you, you probably, I'm sure you can't give an accurate answer to this because so much of it would be subconscious, but how often do you find, how often do you consciously find yourself leaning into or drawing from things that, you know, stuff that you saw go real wrong and stuff that you saw go real right during all those years where you're exposed to, to so many companies that were, you know, kind of, yeah. kind of paving ways. Like it seems to, I, I think about, I think about the uh, here in the states. There used to be a, a commercial a farmers insurance commercial. A spokesperson would say, uh, you know, talking about their agents. They, our agents know a few things because they've seen a few. Seen things, a few things, right? Yeah, yeah, like, I know so, commercials. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it kind of comes to mind in this situation. How you know, as I said, it's a it, it, fourteen years at McKinsey's uh, not a common path uh, to jump right into uh, biotech startup, but at the same time, it seems like there'd be a ton of value that, that you can draw. And as you're making the decisions and, and turning the dials and pulling the levers ar across your personnel and your clinical approach and all uh, these yeah, things you just uh, talked absolutely, about. Absolutely, Matt. I, I think there is there is one thing that probably anybody that spends a lot of time looking at industries sort of on a cross-sectional view yeah. will learn, which is that oftentimes the corporate side of the world, the, the, the big companies, et cetera, either because they're big or because they don't really pay too much attention to it. They, sometimes it, or most of the times there, there is a lot of value in taking decisions quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. And and that's just difficult in a corporate world. I think it's not just pharma or biotech, anybody that would come with, with my experience would probably see that. Now that's of course something that is really embedded in, in, in Moon Lake is the bias for a decision. Mm -hmm. Right. So so that we move fast. You, you hear me talking about this all the time. I, I would argue that it, from my own personal experience, I've seen so many things that I thought were done wrong mm -hmm. um, that that I that I, I I think I think it's really like the pharmacy insurance uh, situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've seen a thing or two. Um, so yeah. so so we can we can do it differently. The industry oftentimes is very uh, conservative. I've done the clinical trial when I was developing the earlier cardiovascular stuff in the 80s. And therefore, my template for clinical development is exactly the one I had, you know, when, yeah. when we were kids. Um, yeah. And, and, and a I've seen a lot of these things. And obviously, you know, we set them differently at, at Moon Lake. Um, you know, the, 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 the point around not having too many people. Yeah, you need people that put their sleeves up and execute on something, not this dilution of huge teams, which then have consultants and all of everybody is doing a lot of paper, but nobody is really doing a lot of the thing that they need to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of this in product development, protocol, interaction with regulators, um, uh, partnership, discussion with investors, et cetera. So a lot of this inefficiencies uh, that, I, that I've seen in a lot of the processes we designed them and we run them at Moon Lake already, already paying attention to those problems. And I think that accelerates. The last thing is the bio, biotechs, in my view, it, you know, oftentimes perhaps because they're founded by, by, by the original scientists, et cetera, um, they're very in love with their own science. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and therefore, it's for the purpose of science. And I want to show you that my molecule is the best every, everywhere. And by the way, I'm going to use my technology to do all these other molecules because I'm going to solve all these problems at the same time. Um, so I think it takes away from the bias to impact, get that product through the hoops to get to the market to address the patient's need, not, you know, let's do another bunch of experiments in a slightly different trial and a trial on this and a trial on that. Um, and also this, what happens a lot of time, which is the distraction of people through multiple programs. I, I really don't believe that a company that is 50 people and has 200 million bucks in the, in the, in the, in the bank really should be developing five assets at the same time. Even if one is clinical and the other four are preclinical, 
Yeah. I think that's a distraction. I think the value of companies like ours is that we can obsessively take one thing and move it forward much faster than pharma. And, uh, you know, dilution of risk, that's the job of the investors. Mm -hmm. The investors in, invest in Moonlake and in a bunch of other companies, but it's not my job to dilute risk. I, I just don't, I just don't, don't believe that that's the role that we play. So all these learnings come into, into Moonlight. Am I wrong or am I right? You know, time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. I mean, in, in form, informed opinions, regardless, wrong or right. Yeah, hopefully so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the investment communities and I, I want to shift, shift gears there, you know, another aspect of uh, biopharma startup leadership uh, that we haven't quite touched on yet. And you guys are set up in an interesting way there. You're, you're Swiss based, uh, you're doing business in the U S and Europe, you're listed on the NASDAQ here in the U S, but you're operating entirely from, from Europe, uh, with hundred uh, percent, U S investors. So walk us through the rationale there. Is that strategic? Was that aligned that way? Uh, purposefully why you when, and why no European investors? <laughs> Uh, yes. So, you're not going to, you're not going to piss any, piss off any uh, European VCs with your response to this question, are you? No, probably not more than, <laughs> than I have already by answering other questions, but <laughs> no, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be straight, straight with you on that. I think there is an element of purposefulness in, in the way we're designed, right? So we are two European founders, uh, the people that we put together to run the company, the way we were just discussing are based in Europe. The technology was based here. The owners of that technology are based here. And we license it from a company that is based here, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, and we have a lot of uh, personal connections to Switzerland. We live in Switzerland. So uh, it all it all made sense. Uh, it's also a great environment to start companies. Um, I think Swiss, Switzerland is a, is a very special place in Europe in terms of how an entrepreneur can really get a company, uh, really get, get a company going. So all of that was was that as a base. Then we needed to go public. We took that decision quite quite early um, because of the amount of funding and the situation that the market was in. Yeah. Uh, and we needed to have that read out or that read through through a public share because of the clinical phase that we're in. That's that's that was our, our strategic decision. Um should we go for a market in Europe? The answer from our side was no. I used to run also uh, McKinsey's biotech practice. So I know the space relatively well. My personal opinion, the European markets are too fragmented. The public markets, they're too fragmented. They're too small and they're largely anemic, right? Mm. Uh, they don't react to news and to real insights from the industry to data, et cetera, the way that you see it in the United States. So if I run a biotech company, I want to be part of a public market that knows how to read my my industry. Yeah. Um, also, Matt, when I was at McKinsey, we did a very interesting study that actually showed that there were several European companies that went to Nasdaq, um, and they did, and they they financed themselves and performed, if not as well as the 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 the, the local companies, even better. Right. Mm. So I knew that. If that market selects an European company, it's probably going to be a good a good asset, right? So for us, that was also that was also a bar. And with that, of course, comes the the, the engagement with with U.S. investors, um, which we, we we talked to a couple of European investors at, at early on, but then we abandoned that idea because we felt that we were making a lot more progress with the U.S. investors at that point in time. I think European investors understand the preclinical space well. Um, I think when things start getting a little bigger and uh, a bit more clinical, I find that the U.S. investors, again, my personal opinion, based on my experience, uh, are far more familiar with the different diseases, are far more familiar with the process. Uh, they're much more sophisticated in that understanding. Um, <clears throat> and, they, and they do two things that accelerate the whole process. They're far more nimble, so they don't need to do all these complicated uh, models and take decisions forever to look for incremental differences. They understand the binary uh, and are comfortable with the binary nature of what you're doing at, at in the clinical phase company. And they're much more familiar with the valuations, yeah. right? So we are not discussing, oh, are you going to, you know, grow 10% and it's all these little incremental discussions. It's much more a, a discussion on this asset, this asset has value. Therefore, we go to a multiple. I don't know if the multiple is two or three or 10, 
But if it works, it's it's a multiple. And if it doesn't, it's zero. But let's not discuss here 10%, 20%. That 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 is not part of the conversation that you typically have with the American investor. And so all of that led to the fact that ultimately we were invested by US investors. We now have European shareholders. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, they people saw value, they're buying our share, and we're very proud to have some of those names associated. And we'll not exclude them in the future. But I think yeah. if you're a company like Moon Lake was in 21, 22, very difficult to not see the attraction of the US investors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, w- once again, uh, sort of a demonstration of the value of years spent uh, observing and uh, observing and researching, right? Perhaps, yeah. perhaps yes. Yeah. <laughs> George, we're, we're running short on time here, but I got a couple couple more questions for you before, sure. we, before we wrap up. You, you mentioned your IPO. Uh, you raised $150 million in that IPO back in uh, uh, April of last year, I think. Um, that happened on the back of a SPAC deal with Helix Acquisitions and Pipe. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that. You know, it seemed like we had a flurry around, around that time, I guess, uh, in, in kind of that six month time frame. there was a flurry of conversation around SPAC deals and, and, you know, there, I guess it was a sort of a pop in the, in the, uh, biotech investment and, and media scene. Um, so in, in the time we have here, if you, if you could just kind of walk us through your reflections on that, what was good, what was bad, what was ugly about that experience, <laughs> uh, obviously more good than bad and ugly, but, uh, g- give us the insider's view. Yeah, no. So when we started the, the SPAC discussion, um, which was spring of 21, mm-hmm. SPACs were some sort of miracle, right? Yeah. It looked great. Everything was amazing. Um, we felt that we were quite judicious in terms of choosing the SPAC because when when you're looking for a SPAC as a potential path and you really sit down and do your homework, you realize that they're, they were quite different and they are very different SPACs. I think so if you're, if you're going through a SPAC in, in, in hot times or in less hot times, I, I think one important learning is make sure you really understand how that SPAC works, right? And in, the, in our case, we had, it was, uh, it was sponsored by Cormorant, which is obviously a, a, a well-known and, and, and high quality blue chip investor in, in biotech. So some quality was there. The people that were part of the trust were fantastic funds. So the quality was there. And the fund was set, uh, the, the SPAC was set in a very standard way. There was no warrants, no funny sponsor shares, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was very, if you will, almost, um, you know, motherhood and apple pie type of SPAC, right? What we realized is that there's were SPACs set in a very different way with people that didn't really understand the space and were not committed with all sorts of structures inside that then came to show that, you know, those things then cannot fly, even if the asset that they incorporate is good, right? Um, What happened to us is that we just got into it as the whole honeymoon was, was coming to an end, right? So one of the tough parts for us is that we then had to close this back as two things were happening. One, which I think was a great thing, we saw a change in regulation. The SEC, for example, asking a lot more questions, Mm -hmm. requiring a lot more information. So that impacted us because instead of doing it in three months or four months, it actually ended up taking us 10 months. Uh, And that, of course, creates challenges for us as a company and financing with the money we had and we didn't have, et cetera. Yeah. But it also set us up to be a far better company and a far better SEC reporting company once we went public, right? So, but of course, for a lot of people, it created a lot of challenges and, and and for some of them, probably they weren't ready to properly respond to those things. But that was a challenge, a challenge for us, which I think makes makes things a lot better today. Um, the other was this logic that as an investor in a SPAC, in the trust, you know, you buy your shares at $10 until the last moment you can say, I want to stay or I want to go. And of course, as the market tumbled down and SPACs got a bad rep, uh, when it came time to close our SPAC, a lot of the people in the trust redeemed. We had actually one of the lowest redemption rates at that time, mm-hmm. um, but but it was still a, a very large a very large redemption. So fortunately for us, and I think that was another learning, we really invested on the pipe. So uh, which is essentially what you do in an IPO. So we could compensate for the redemption level by raising new money, right? So yes, it was a SPAC, but we had to do a pipe. Basically, like you do, like you do in a, in a, in a, in an IPO, 
And then, of course, out of all of this, Spikes got a very negative press. There was a lot of redemption. So therefore, instead of getting to market at $10, which is the standard price num number, and then go from there, all Spikes had all Spikes at that time were just going down from 10 to 5 or 4 or 3, which yeah. is exactly what happened to us. And so you have you start from a lower base, you start losing. Um, so it's like, you know, first first play of the other guys and they score a touchdown and and and, and there you are going up uphill, right? So that's what we did. But I think there, when if you have a great story and if you have the right investors, the right people stayed with you, you got the right people involved in the pipe, this will all clean out. And I think now we're uh, you know, three times that that that, that value. So already, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of touchbacks in front of the other of the other team. Yeah, nice. Well, I like the, I like the football analogies. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> it just strikes me, you guys, you had like a at least a triple whammy there, right? Yeah, or around your time of founding, COVID. You know, the the markets uh, for a time spir spiraling the drain, uh, the private markets in particular, and then and then you know the 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 rise and fall of the SPAC deal. You've experienced it all. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, but I really tell you, I mean, for all the guys also out there listening, right? Um, you'll always be in love with your asset. I get it. So it's always a great asset. Um, but make sure that you have you have great investors, right? Because if you have those guys, they will stick with you, right? And they will help you navigate. And I think we're we're very fortunate to have, you know, companies like BVF, which is a founder a founder partner to us, the Cormorant guys, which sponsors the SPAC and all the guys they brought in. Mm -hmm. um, that that obviously really really makes a difference in in what was, as you say, Matt, a really a really perfect storm. Uh, yeah, volatile us. sort of, sort of tumultuous volatile times. Um, yes. All right, we're going to wrap things up here, but before we do, I want to give you an opportunity to uh, just give us an update on next steps, like next clinicals. You referenced a few of them, but just tell us like what's uh, what's on the immediate horizon for yeah. uh, for, yeah. for no, George. 23, like. 23 is the, the hot year for us. Um, we read our HS primary endpoint in June. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, we are the first ever clinical trial to try a primary endpoint at 75% of improvement. Mm -hmm. So that would be likely a, a, a momentous event for, for all the patients out there with HS. And there's prevalence is somewhere between one and 2%, Matt, which is, which is mind blowing. Yeah. Um, we will then uh, read the 24 week date in September. We will read the PSA um, primary endpoint in December uh, and then uh, the the twenty four weeks for PSA in following March. So we are on a three month tech time of data. I think for those following the field and interested in our company, there's a big catalyst also coming now in March. All our competitors read their their HS data, so all the cards will be turned now in March at the American Dermatology Meeting in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, and and as I said, our our data can, comes three months later. Uh, so lots of reads in the in these indications this year. Um, and certainly we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be very much looking forward to, 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 to our success throughout uh, 23. And then uh, we'll see what we do next uh, back to your previous question. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be paying attention. I'm sure we'll be, uh, we'll be seeing more from you guys and, uh, you know, maybe as we turn the corner from 23 to 24 and there's a whole lot more to talk about, we'll get you back on the show to, to share some updates. Uh, but in the meantime, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I, I want to uh, thank you for your transparency and your thoughtful responses to my questions. I think there's a ton of value here for our audience in terms of, you know, what you did, how you did it, uh, and, and your, you know, your perspective on, on, on getting some of that stuff done. So thank my you. My pleasure, Matt. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure too. So that's Moonlight Therapeutics, founder and CEO, Dr. George Santos da Silva. I'm Matt Pillar. This is the business of biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online and supported by Cytiva, which demonstrates its commitment to new and emerging biopharma companies at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. Go check that out. Check us out at bioprocessonline.com. Uh, and be sure to sign up for the business of biotech newsletter at bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. In the meantime, and as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>